Dear audience, uh, this webinar belongs to the VPH keynote webinar series, which is a quarterly event organized by the VPH student committee, which provides access for the senior community members and the expert competence for young scientists, but also for VPH community as a whole. Today, we have the privilege to hear a presentation from Aaron Lazari, MD, PhD, who is the scientific director from the National Center for Spinal Disorders from Budapest, Hungary. He's a spine surgeon, but he is also principal or co-investigator of several scientific and clinical studies, published more than 13 scientific publications in the last five years, member of the Department of Musculoskeletal Oncology at the Semmelweis University, and he's also the member for the Eurospine Young Leaders Forum, and as well for the AOSpine Tumor Knowledge Forum. His research interest is related to the elements of individualized spine surgery, from decision support to patient-specific implants. In this webinar, Dr. Lazari will share his experience and vision about the role of computational technologies in spine surgery. These technologies and methods create the basis for further development of spine surgical techniques and as well for implant development. So please, Aaron. Thank you, Peter. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. It's a great honor for me to be here and to give you this presentation. As Peter said, uh, I'm a spine surgeon. I spend about uh, 30 hours in the operating theater in a week. So I cannot focus on the, on the scientific details and on, on the very technical uh, issues of computational simulations. The aim of this presentation, the aim of this uh, talk, is to widen your focus, to, to open your mind, and uh, to, to show you that, uh, that computational methods or computational simulations uh, mean uh, a significant uh, uh, issue, a significant uh, 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 asset for, the, for a spine surgeon. So my vision is that uh, in the future, and in the very near future, in spine surgery, this kind of techniques can have a significant role, and all of these uh, efforts are going to the direction to develop, to improve the patient care, to develop the real patient-specific approaches, the real patient-specific spine surgeries. And uh, I will show you some very simple examples where we, can, we could uh, use these techniques in our everyday clinical uh, life. But uh, first of all, uh, I would like to introduce uh, my, uh, myself and, and uh, the institution, because it's a quite special place. I mean that uh, the National Center for Spinal Disorders in Budapest, in Hungary, it's a, it's a spine center. Uh, we have more than 100 beds, and we do more than 2,500 spine surgeries in a year. It means that this hospital, only dedicated for spine, spinal disorders and for spinal surgeries, is the largest in Central Europe in this, uh, in this field. Uh, there is a quite special uh, management or, or structural uh, background of this institution. But uh, the most important thing is that our director, the Peter Paul Varga, is, uh, is so his main, uh, his main interest is not only the surgery, but also the research. So that's why he, build, he has built up this institution uh, where the research and the, spa and the surgical uh, activity are next to each other or, or are going uh, in parallel. And the philosophy uh, where we are working in it's the comprehensive spine care. It means that our or or all of the uh, all of the doctors' main interest or main uh, main uh, intent is the to help the people, help the patient patients. Uh, with that, we we can serve the society. But uh, there are, there are a lot of or a number of different dimensions of the healthcare. 
Here you can see the main dimensions of the comprehensive of the comprehensive spine center from the outpatient clinic to the education. I will show you this kind of philosophy through um, uh, through a patient. But uh, before that, we have to uh, declare that in our institution in, at the CSD, we treat the four main major spine pathology groups, the deformities, the tumors, the degenerative diseases, and the trauma patients. And uh, I will use a deformity patient to show you this kind of philosophy where we, where we are working in. So in the center of the, of the, of the workflow, uh, or the network is the that is the patient, and uh, for example, this uh, fifteen year old uh, girl with this kind of severe scoliotic curved spine. This is not only a, 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 not only a, a problem of of uh, her beauty. I mean that not only an aesthetic problem, but this kind in in case of this kind of uh, severe scoliotic spine. The lung function, the heart function, the abdominal function is uh, are also decreased. It means that uh, this patient uh, uh, can have some severe problem with the breathing, with the heart uh, uh, function, and with the physical exercises and so on. And uh, also they are uh, they are thin, and uh, mal malnutrition is also a, a big problem. So with the progression of such a disease. The patient can be in a very bad uh, general health, uh, health problem. To plan the treatment of this patient, this, the very detailed evaluation is crucial. Regarding the spine, the evaluation uh, means not only the detailed imaging studies, but also the uh, evaluation of the assessment of the physical performance, assessment of the neurology. The, the symptoms and signs and so on. But no question that imaging and imaging of the spine is a crucial step. Actually, there is no patient who, who is indicated for a surgery without imaging, detailed imaging studies. This is a very important uh, thing if we are thinking about computational uh, science because we have the basic data for every patient. The images. After that, uh, in our hospital, there is also um, a psychological department because uh, it's well known that not only the disease itself, the spinal disease itself, but also the whole process of the treatment is influenced by the psycho psychosocial issues. So, for example, all of these scoliotic uh, children. Uh, have, have got this uh, possibility to get psychosocial support during the treatment process. And sometimes it means uh, a lot of time because sometimes the uh, surgical treatment uh, has to be uh, done in several phases. The patient has to spend months in the hospital. And during this, uh, during this time and right after the, the, uh, the uh, discharge. This kind of psychosocial support is very important. Regarding another, uh, regarding another patient group, the degenerative diseases, the screening for psychosocial risk factors are also very important. After that, we do the well-planned treatment, uh, the surgery, for example, and after that we, can, we have uh, a result. This is the immediate result of the patient, but it's only actually an immediate picture about the, the uh, process of the surgical treatment and the surgery. The, the immediate result of the surgery can say something. For example, every screw is in the right place, but this, the immediate result doesn't say anything about the long-term uh, uh, function of the patient, about the wound healing, about the... Uh, physical uh, improvement, so we need a uh, follow-up. And this is another advantage, is with, uh, uh, another advantage with the spinal patient, patients, that long-term follow-up is available for these patients, and not only functional follow-up, but also imaging follow-ups. 
So here you can see the, the picture of the patient and you can remember for the pictures before the surgery. What you can see is a, is a well-shaped and, and, uh, and a normal uh, girl in the teenager uh, hood. So it's very, this you can imagine and you can understand the, understand the importance of such a surgery. The next uh, very uh, important uh, patient group in our hospital is the tumors. Primary and metastatic tumors of the, of the spine uh, sh should be treated uh, or has, has, have to be treated surgically in several cases. But uh, it, also, it always requires a multidisciplinary approach. The management of such patients because of the complexity of the disease, because of the uh, biological issues, can be very challenging, and often the surgery is crucial, especially with primary tumors, which are rare diseases in, in spine, but only, almost only the, the surgery is the only one treatment choice. And our center is a tumor center. Here you can see a huge, enormous uh, uh, sacral chordoma cases, where you can see that these kind of tumors can grow uh, for years without any special symptoms, and sometimes the patients uh, come to the hospital in a, in a quite late stage. Regarding the sacra tumors, our institution developed, uh, uh, developed a, a workflow or a chart, flow chart for the, for the treatment. And here you can see that in case of a primary malignant tumor, only the unblock resection can cure the patient. So this, called, this is called total sacrectomy, when the whole sacra tumor is is uh, resected in one piece. But you can imagine that if I reject the whole sacral bone here, there will be a huge defect in the body. Defect of the soft tissues, defect of the body bone. But on the other hand, there is a huge defect in the load transmitting structures, in the load trans transmitting lines. So because the sacral bone can, uh, can lead the uh, body load into the, uh, through the pelvis into the, into the uh, lower extremities. So it's also a very demanding uh, surgical uh, issue, the total sacrectomies, but it's also a very demanding biomechanical issue. So here you can see the answer on the biomechanical question after a sacrectomy. This is the lumbar pelvic stabilization. It means that we try to restore the biomechanical integrity of the lumbar sacral pelvic region with use of screws and rods. And if you, if you deal with spine surgeries, you will meet a number, a lot of screws and rods. These are our primary implants. And, uh, but the goal is to make a bony connection, a bony fusion between the lumbar spine and the pelvic ring. This is the end result in years or after the years after the surgery. And this construct here, what you can uh, see is the closed loop construct, the closed loop technique, what was developed uh, by Dr. Varga here in the institution more than 15 years ago. And he, without any previous uh, biomechanical measurements or, 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 or proof, he, was, he believed that this kind of construct with this single road, closed road system can prove an optimal phase, an optimal place for the bony fusion somehow. Here you can see an example with a huge sacral malignant tumor, a chordoma, uh, in a young patient. Here you can see the dimensions of the tumor. The only way is to reject this tumor in one piece. This is the picture uh, during the surgery where the tumorous tissue is removed. And uh, after that, you can see the uh, screws and the, and the closed loop rod in place and some uh, parts of the body wall reconstruction. This is the resected tumor with the sacral bone here and with the huge tumor with necrotic parts here. And this is the two months follow up whole standing x ray of the patient. You can see the construct. You can see the connection between the lumbar spine and the pelvis. 
you can see that the uh, uh, alignment of the of the whole body and the trunk is quite good. And here you can see the uh, short-term result. During this surgery, a number of nerve roots are resected. So we have to cut some nerves. That's why the patient has got some uh, problems with, with the gait. And uh, he's got also some uh, planned problems or expected problems with the vegetative symptoms. But there is no more option, no other option to do that uh, surgery, only with this sacrificing of the nerve roots. And here you can see the one year follow-up. The patient can walk without any aid. There is no any need for con uh, constant pain medication, and he can work. So regarding the extent, regarding the severity of the disease, regarding the extent of the surgery, this is a very good uh, long-term or, or medium-term result. Now we have the long-term result of the patient. I will show you later. But we have a, uh, another and much more common uh, this, uh, problems or, or, or uh, disease group in spine patient. And this is related to the, this degeneration, the degeneration of the intervertebral disc. Between every... Every two vertebrae, vertebrae, there is an intervertebral disc in the spine, and this, especially at the lumbar area, the degeneration process, which is a biological process with biomechanical consequences, can cause uh, symptomatic diseases for the patient. There is a quite high vari variety of, the, of these degenerative diseases, but this group of patients uh, is is very is, is huge. I mean that uh, uh, symptoms, for example, low back pain uh, related to this degeneration is a really worldwide problem, causing uh, uh, significant disability and uh, work compensation uh, uh, all around the world. On the other hand, it's a very interesting biological and biomechanical process because we know that. Not all the degenerated discs cause problems, cause symptoms or diseases. There can, you can have a very severe degenerated disc without any symptom. On the other hand, slight phase or, or, or slight signs of degeneration can cause pain. On the other hand, in the same patient, you can have discs, intervertebral discs, in different phases of degeneration, and you can have a quite long-term degeneration history. For example, if you see this patient, this MRI on the lumbar sacral disc, there is a quite slight degeneration, but, but finally the patient had a herniation, a small disc herniation, not very uh, big, causing a nerve root irritation. So this patient had significant uh, leg pain, finally, we did a surgery on, on her and removed only this very small part of the, of the sequestered disc, what caused the clinical problem. On the other hand, this patient had got had multi-level disc degeneration, severe disc degeneration, causing not only disc herniation here, but deformity. You can see this is a degenerative scoliosis, slippage of, of, of the L4 vertebral and spinal canal stenosis. So degeneration process can lead to a very severe widespread condition uh, of, the, of the spine, causing severe disability of the patient, severe pain, and, uh, uh, disability and, and uh, this patient couldn't work anymore. But on the other hand, she was only 50, 50 years old. So in this case, if you see the X-ray, and here you can understand why the degeneration process uh, significantly related, is significantly related to the biomechanics and to the whole body biomechanics. Because in, if you see the standing X-ray of the patient, uh, you can see that with the degeneration, not only a scoliotic curve, a deformity is appear, appears, 
but also the patient uh, loss loses the lordosis. So degeneration means this degeneration means loss of lordosis in general. And if you lose some lordosis at the lumbar area and your spine uh, becomes uh, more and more straight, you have to compensate from your hip and from your thoracic spine to maintain your upright position. Otherwise, you will go forward and you will fall forward. So this patient was in a, a compensated sagittal disbalance situation, but it takes a lot of effort. Muscles, the patient, these patients are always tired because of this extra muscle work. And this is a painful condition because of the, of the, of the biomechanically unbalanced situation. Regarding the energy, this is uh, of the energy consumption of the whole body. This is a, an unfavorable condition. So what we can do in this situation? We have to restore the alignment and the balance of the spine. Here you can see the plumb lines and the shape of the spine before. And here you can see after the surgery. The, we, with, the, with the restoration of the lumbar, uh, lumbar lordosis, and with the stabilization of this new situation, the thoracic, thoracic kyphosis increased spontaneously because the, after the surgery, the patient uh, didn't need to uh, compensate, didn't need to, to uh, compensate the sagittal imbalance because after the surgery, she was in balance. So it was a more balanced situation. But the surgery took a lot, a lot of time. It was a whole day long surgery. And it was a big challenge for the patient too and for the surgeon too. On the other hand, we also corrected the, the coronal curve. Here you can see the AP view. And on the other hand, this kind of huge surgeries has got a quite a low satisfaction rate. I mean that only two thirds of the patients are satisfied with the results. There is a high rate for any complication. More than 60% of the patient has got any postoperative complication, and half of them is quite severe. And in case in third of the patients, we have some type of bony or implant failure. Here you can see the, the predilection sites for any kind of failure. For example, the proximal or cranial end of the implant construct is biomechanically a very crucial site. And uh, in a lot of cases, here we can see a vertebral fracture, loosening of the screws, and so on. On the other hand, the uh, lordotic curve, we have to restore the lordosis, but and after that, we have to achieve a fusion, a bony fusion. In more than 10, 15 percent of the patients, there will be some non-union here. And if there is a non-union, a non-fusion, with time, the patient will lose the lower doses, will lose the implant, so revision surgery should be done. The other uh, site for the, for the complications is at the bottom of the surgery, at the sacro-pelvic junction or site because here we have uh, if we don't use an extra anchoring for the implants we will have a loosening at the sacra bone at the sacra screws so a lot of biomechanical considerations should be done at the planning process of such kind of uh, huge surgeries and at the implementation or during the surgery on the other hand the real value and the patient-specific parameters or the patient-specific patient, patient issues of these biomechanical details are not known. Actually, the degenerative disorders was the point where we met in silico medicine uh, uh, some years ago, I will tell you. Uh, but 
before that, I want to uh, show you an example about a real uh, uh, huge population problem. Because with the population aging, the low energy trauma and the low energy fracture, spinal fractures, are more and more common uh, disorders. Here you can see a typical case with a T12, toracal 12 compression fracture. Here you can see the fracture. It's quite severe. The patient actually was in the bed for two months because of the pain and because of some nerve root, uh, or uh, because of some neural compression. And if you see the thoracolumbar lumbar, uh, x-ray of the patients, you can imagine the biomechanical instability of this situation. This is the standing x-ray, and this is the lying x-ray. And you can see the difference between the loaded and the unloaded situation. So it's clear that with this biomechanical situation, the pa patient cannot load uh, her body. She cannot, she can't walk, can't do anything, only lying, which is very dangerous. 20% of untreated vertebral compression fracture patients die after one in, in the first, during the first year after the search, after the uh, fracture. So it can be a death causing disease. The treatment of the patient was uh, this surgery. We removed the uh, fractured and uh, unhealthy vertebral bone. We put uh, a bone cement, a PMME, bone cement uh, plumbage, and it means the, some kind of custom made prosthesis uh, instead of the vertebral bone. Uh, and we did um, a, a very strong stabilization uh, construct with cemented screws below and above the, the fracture site. You can see that we was able to restore the alignment of the spine. So actually, we were quite happy. And the patient was also very happy because right after the surgery, she was able to move, she was able to walk. And at the discharge, she only took some medication for the wound uh, pain and not for the severe biomechanical pain. Unfortunately, six weeks after the surgery, the patient called me that something happened because she's got a new pain lower uh, than before. First time, I, I expected some, some problems with the construct and some problems with inside the construct. But uh, when we did the x-ray, I saw that a new fracture, a new uh, compression fracture because of the osteoporosis developed before uh, below the constant. So this is, I was uh, uncertain that this situation, I think it was good for the for the fracture, but regarding the whole body, it wasn't enough. On the other hand, what should have what uh, should have been done. I mean that uh, uh, we cannot operate the whole whole spine, the whole body, because on the other we, we have a cost issue, we have a risk issue, and so on. But from the biomechanical point of view, it's a good example for the failure of a theoretically good treatment. So regarding these spine pathologies, we have a lot of open questions in our clinical practice. And these questions are almost always patient-specific problems. There is also a failure, but we can see a failure of the general, generalized approach. And every spinal patient has got uh, biomechanical issues. Every surgery has got biomechanical consequences. I also want to show you that the, in our institution, we started to use a, a new or another approach for science, for research, because the traditional research started with the basic science approach. And the, uh, after the basic science uh, results were uh, transferred to some kind of clinical research. And after that, years after that, we had some clinical experience. 
we think that sometimes we have to change that. And we have to uh, start with the clinical experience because clinicians can see where are the gaps, where are the, the clinically significant problems affecting a lot of patients without any real answer, without any real solution. We can do on clinical, clinical researches on, on, on these questions and uh, the consequences of the clinical researches can be answered or can be uh, proved by the basic science methodology. This can be one way for the future evolution of, of uh, spine surgery, future development of spinal implants. And here we can see, uh, we, are, we see a really important role of in silico methodology. This paper was the first uh, point when I met in silico science and when I met uh, computational methods. This paper was published by a Japanese group and uh, Norio Kawahara and Kachuro Tomita are very well-known names in spine tumor patients. So when I started my practice here at the hospital uh, 15 years ago and I uh, started to read to read papers about spinal tumors, I met this paper. And actually, I didn't understand anything about the methodology. I only saw some very nice, colorful uh, images. And I understood that somehow they modeled the surgery. They modeled the biomechanical uh, uh, situation after a sacrectomy after the surgery that I, uh, that I showed you before. And I only understood that with this methodology, they found the weakest point of the construct. So I realized that this kind of approach, without any cadaver uh, uh, experiment, without any, uh, I don't know, any bloody issues, this kind of methodology can answer some really important issues. So after that, I tried to be familiar, more familiar with this uh, methodology, but it wasn't easy, I, I can tell you, because I realized that the anatomy of the spine is very complex. Regarding the normal spine, it's quite complex, but if you have a disease, for example, a deformation, a fracture, uh, a degeneration, can really influence the anatomy and really influence the biomechanics. But we started to think in 3D. We started to think in 3D technologies. You know, a spine surgeon has to work in 3D because you have to put the screws into the, into the vertebra bodies. You have to understand the 3D anatomy. But the morphology is only the first point. Now we can generate or we can uh, create the space and specific morphological models and we can print it out then with 3D printers. But this, this is only one thing. On the other hand, I underst understood that I learned that if we uh, fill this morphological mesh with patient-specific data, we can use the, our model to simulate different conditions that are really clinically re relevant. Here you can see a very uh, nice example for that because you can see the anchoring, uh, anchoring uh, uh, features of a screw in the vertebra in case of normal bone here and in case of osteoporotic bone here. You know, for a surgeon, you can, you should uh, trust me. Surgeons are quite simple people. I mean, in that they really like to see the clinical relevance of, of a scientific step. And if I can show them, if I can show the surgeons that here you can see the difference between the anchoring properties of normal and osteoporotic bone. Actually, this is the displacement of the screw after, after, uh, uh, after loading. The surgeon can understand why these technologies are very important and can be useful for them. 
And if I do that, I can do some kind of in silico uh, science and in silico medicine. I can create some evidence on that and I can publish that, I can show them. And this is the way of, for the future. So the first, uh, our first big project, I mean that the real project in silico medicine was the MySpine project. As I know you, or, uh, or in this webinar series, the MySpine was presented by our coordinator, Damien Lacroix, but I, so I only want to uh, show you some uh, raw details. I mean that the MySpine project aimed to develop a software tool uh, for the creation of the patient-specific whole lumbar spine model. It was the first one. And after that, we simulated different, here you can see the model, and after that, we can simulate the different kind of treatment possibilities. And uh, we, uh, the software could calculate the consequences, <coughs> I'm sorry, the consequences of the different kind of treatment. So we tried to make steps toward the patient-specific prognostic simulation. And it was quite successful. We also realized that this kind of approach is quite challenging, requiring a lot of computational time, requiring, requiring a lot of calculations, uh, and so on. But it's very promising. So that's after that we uh, we created uh, our own uh, work group and laboratory here at the National Center for Spinal Disorders, and we started our own projects on toward the patient-specific spine surgery. So our primary goals are to support the indication for any surgery, the analysis and optimization of a certain surgical technique. And we realized that we should create, we should uh, form uh, evidence, uh, evidence uh, behind the clinical activity of us. We also know that we can do that only with you. I mean that only with national and international partners in research. So that's why we, we found and we are also looking for uh, partners to do this kind of clinically focused uh, spine surgical related simulation studies. And I will show you now some examples uh, on that. Here you can see, uh, you, you remember the, the tumor patient and the, the huge surgery. And uh, this is the five year follow up of the patient. You can see the uh, closed loop reconstruction and you can see the bony fusion, the final result of this patient. But actually, we were, we were very interested about the process. And uh, this is also the CT pictures with the new bone formed around the screws and around the implants. So uh, we uh, uh, analyzed the uh, CT scans uh, on, uh, in the follow -up, during the follow-up of this patient because we, we wanted to prove the original theory of the development of this kind of closed-loop construct about the shock absorption, about the facilitating uh, feature of this uh, this kind of closed loop technique, but was the original idea of uh, of, of my boss. And uh, here you can see the deformation and the, the uh, change in the in the uh, screw rod construct with time. We also measured this kind of deformation, so you can see that in a, a certain point of the of the uh, construct uh, compared to a coordinate system, using the coordinate system with a fixed point, there is a quite a complex deformation due uh, displacement in time. On the other hand, we also try to measure the changes in the bony, in the fusion mass, because we try to connect or relate the deformation uh, and, the, and the fusion mass uh, development. So a finite element model was uh, created from a, a certain slice of the patient. And here you can see the, the change or the difference with time. At the end of the process, at the fusion site, a huge and massive 
newborn formed. If we analyze that numerically, we can see that the number of strong bone elements or the number of elements uh, with the strong bone properties uh, increased with time and the uh, whole, uh, especially, especially during the first two years. So this, that was some kind of evidence or measurement on the, on the clinical process. What we can see in the patient, now we can somehow understand or measure this kind of clinical process or biological process. So we, we use the simulation for, for the evidence-based clinical follow-up. The second project uh, was related, is related also to, to a surgical process developed in this institution because we with the aging, aging uh, population, which is a huge uh, worldwide problem, we have more and more patients in the patients in the uh, in the condition so-called aging spine, aging spine problem. It's characterized by osteoporosis, severe degeneration, spinal stenosis, and deformity as consequences. But actually, a lot of patients has got low or, or bad general condition for a huge surgery. On the other hand, the life expectancy can be 10 or, or, or more uh, years, but the patients cannot move because of the pain. So we try to do something. I mean that some, uh, we develop the surgical method uh, without, any, uh, without uh, any severe risk, surgical risk, because uh, at the stage, at the very severe or very late stage of this degeneration, you can have some vacuum, empty space inside the disc. You can imagine that what does it mean biomechanically? There, is a, there isn't anything among the, uh, between the two vertebrae. On the other hand, sometimes or, or frequently, the osteophytes are not enough to stabilize the spine. So this condition can be very unstable biomechanically, and this is the cause of the pain. The patient uh, with such condition doesn't have any pain lying in lying position, but has got uh, severe pain in standing position, loaded position. So the technique that was developed uh, is called percutaneous cement discoplasty. When we fill out the empty space between the two vertebral body with PMME bone cement, giving a stabilization, segmental stabilization for the spine. And we do, we, are, we do that through a trocar, through a small incision, a hole uh, on, the uh, on, the, on the skin of the patient. So it's a percutaneous minimal invasive procedure. That's why this can be done in patients in, who are in very bad general conditions. On the other hand, what we see on the x-rays with the clinical follow-up that there is an increase at the neuroforam area. This is the consequence of the, of the surgery. The foraminal area where the nerve roots are coming out from the spine can increase. But we couldn't measure that. So we used in, uh, silico in silico computational techniques to measure the clinical effect. Here you can see a patient, and we choose that segment uh, between uh, L1 and 2, uh, lumbar 1 and 2. And here you can see the 3D model of the bony uh, environment. This is the post-operative CT with the cement, and this is the uh, sh shape or the mesh of the bony uh, of the cement injected into the into the uh, intervertebral space. And if we compare the Preoperative and postoperative situation, we can measure the displacement of the of the vertebral bodies. We can measure the uh, uh, and here you can see the result, the graphical representation of the 3D uh, displace, displacement of the vertebral bodies, thanks to the surgery, and we can also measure with the, this trick the change in the volume 
of the neuroforaminal area, anatomical area. So preoperatively and the postoperative volumes were compared, and we calculated that more than a half cubic centimeter uh, on uh, was the, the positive change, the difference between the postoperative and preoperative geometry. This is the extra space what the nerve roots uh, uh, got due to the surgery. So this was also some kind of evidence-based measurement about the clinical effect. Finally, I want to show you another uh, project with another aim. Because here we had this patient. Actually, I did the surgery. And uh, first, it was quite good. But in the lumbar sacral area, some kind of implant failure, the, the break of the screw was developed. First, we, re we removed all, all kinds of uh, implants. Only the, the broken uh, part of the screw was uh, remained uh, in the sacral bone. But unfortunately, this decompression wasn't enough. So because there was a significant non-union, significant non-fusion in the lumbar sacral area. So we decided on a revision surgery. But for do that, we had to put a new screw into the lumbar sacral area. So first, considering the co very complex anatomy of, the, of this uh, pelvis, pelvic area, we decided to create some kind of surgical guide, some kind of navigation to help the revision surgery. Here you can see the workflow, where we first segmented the uh, patient's sacral bone. With the, you can see also the holes of the previous screws and the broken screw inside. After that, the finite element model was created from this uh, anatomy, from this uh, morphology. And we tested the two different and two possible new positions for the new screw. Here you can see a conventional position. Here you can see the divergent position for the new screw. And it was tested in, uh, by, by means of the displacement for a, for a given stre uh, stress. And we concluded that the conventional S1 position would be better. After that, um, um, the guide uh, was uh, designed for the patient-specific anatomy with the leading channels for the screw positioning. And this, uh, this guide was uh, 3D printed out by a small company, a small startup company in Hungary. Actually, we won um, um, SME instrument uh, uh, application with the, in, in, in connection with this company. So we are working together on some projects. Finally, it was made by metal using some tricks. And this is the picture of the surgery. I'm inserting the, I'm putting the guide for the surface of the sacral bone. And it was absolutely fit. It, it absolutely fit the surface, the anatomy. So I only use this, this channel, this root, to put the new screw. Here you can see the intraoperative x-rays. And here you can see the final result on x-ray, on CT, and its numerical implementation, numerical, calcu uh, numerical calculation. This uh, cylinder was the expected uh, or planned route. And this is the final place of, uh, of the screw. You can see some uh, difference between uh, two of them, but it's absolutely tolerable. It's more, it's more uh, proper than the, than the other CT-based or, or uh, fluoroscopy-based navigation tools. So, we use this kind of patient-specific models and simulations to solve a clinical problem, to solve the revision surgery safely. 
So as a conclusion, I think that the patient-specific spine surgery is one way for the future, not for every patient, but for, for more and more patients. But we have to consider the anatomy because anatomy is always patient-specific. On the other hand, regarding the spine, there are also some local bone properties uh, issues. I mean that uh, not only the patient can have an osteoporosis or not, can have healthy or bad bone, but inside one vertebra, one certain vertebra, the bone properties can be very different in, in, in different locations. And it can really uh, influence the anchoring property of your screw. Sometimes I use cementing of the screw only in one side of the bone, because the other side, there can be much more stronger, uh, much stronger bone because of the degeneration process. But I cannot calculate that now. Theoretically, I can use in simulations. I only can feel that during the surgery. But you know, feeling is not science. On the other hand, uh, uh, with one patient, we also have to consider the natural process of the aging and the degeneration. We do now a surgery, a therapeutic process, a therapeutic step. But we have, we have to calculate, or we should calculate, with the years, with the years, with the with the with the patient uh, in 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 five or ten years, because frankly now we are doing a lot of surgeries bec uh, uh, on a lot of patients who were operated five or ten years uh, ago, and sometimes in a significant part of the uh, patients, the indication for the present surgery is the biomechanical failure of the previous surgery. So we think, and there are some evidence on that, that future surgeries, future deterioration, deterioration of these patients can be avoided with the proper patient-specific approaches, considering the biomechanics and considering the biology of the patient. As we see, the, the, the 3D thinking and the 3D technologies in this topic is crucial. We cannot, do, we cannot achieve this kind of uh, uh, aims without 3D technologies. And on the other hand, we cannot do that without the participation of the spine surgeons. Because finally, we can develop anything. You can develop anything as engineers, as, as scientists, as researchers. You can find very nice, very good things. Very, we can write a lot of uh, good papers. We can develop implants. We can develop uh, surgical methods. But finally, the surgeons, we use that. So without the surgeons, we cannot realize any development in, in the clinical practice. And don't forget, never forget, that the final goal of our research activity is the development or improve of the clinical practice. That's why we did an online survey about a half year ago among the EOS time membership. Because we were very interested about the acceptance and the limitations of the, of the 3D technologies among the surgeons. We have about, we have about uh, 300 responders all around the world. And here you can see some, uh, some uh, details, some results. Here you can see that the, in the acceptance of these kind of 3D technologies, modeling, simulations, 3D printing, 3D printed implants, navigation guides, and so on, summarizing all of these kind of things, there is a significant difference among the regions of the world. And, and not only the regions, but also the development uh, level of a country is significantly associated with this kind of acceptance of these new innovative steady technologies. On, on the other hand, if we are looking at the barriers, looking at the limits, limitations of the spreading of these kind of techniques, most of the surgeons answer that these technologies are expensive, which is actually not true. 
not true anymore. On the other hand, we realize that the surgeons are not aware of the possibilities provided by 3D printing modality. So our first mission, or the, the most important uh, task is to spread the knowledge, not only among biomechanics, not only among bioengineers, but among the surgeons. And trust me, easy, easy, understandable, clean, so-called small projects and clinically relevant results can affect the surgeons primary. These kind of projects can open their eyes, can open their mind about the next, about the future possibilities. So in silico methods, I can tell you, I, I am sure that it can help the future of the medicine, the future medicine. But on the other hand, it requires, there are some requirements. For example, the future development or the development uh, process needs a comprehensive institutional backgrounds and collaborators. We cannot do anything alone. The experience, in one hand, the experience from surgeons, from clinicians are very important to address clinically important problems, gaps, places for future development. On the other hand, the knowledge of, of the special knowledge of the engineers, of, of the simulation or IP guys are very important to, to realize, to, to, to do the simulations and the, and the models. No questions that innovative minds in this field are very important and we can do that together. I mean that we can achieve these kind of goals uh, through a living, live relationship between surgeons and scientists, surgeons and engineers, and so on. Otherwise, we will lose the we will lose the point. Thank you for your attention. Here you can see our email addresses, and we are very open for the questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Aaron, for the presentation. Um, I would like to address the first question. Um, what is your opinion? Uh, in the case of lytic lesions, uh, which affect the spine, uh, are there any role for simulation? It can help the surgeon in the decision-making process? Absolutely. Uh, regarding the... I think the question is about the lytic uh, tumors and the metastatic lesions. Because, because one, in one hand, the osteoporosis itself is uh, causing some lysis. I mean, that some disappearance in the bone or deterioration in the bone quality. But regarding the tumors, it's, uh, that it's, it's another growing problem. I mean, that more and more patient, uh, patients have got spinal metastasis, secondary tumor in the vertebral body. And it can really affect the patient's life, not only the life expectancy, but also the life quality, because it can be painful and it can cause a pathological fracture, which can be fatal. So sometimes frequently to assess, to determine the risk for any fracture is crucial in the in the treatment process of these patients but we don't have any uh, any objective tool to do that now i mean that we can see the mri we can see the ct the x-ray sometimes the really significant uh, or really clear uh, instability uh, is clear from the from the images on the other hand, there is a huge population where there is no clear uh, instability at the time of the diagnosis, but th there can be a progression of the disease, and the progression of the disease can cause or can lead to uh, clinical instability, spinal instability and fracture. A preventive surgery should be indicated to prevent 
the biomechanical deterioration. The next question is that uh, in a clinical environment, generally it's not available high computing infrastructure. But uh, as you mentioned, you have done already some uh, uh, projects, uh, but uh, it is a real requirement for some simulation computation to have a, a powerful computational uh, uh, infrastructure. How do you overcome this uh, difficulty in your uh, case? Yeah. Thank you for the question. Uh, we there are uh, different possibilities, but the, maybe the most important one in this community is to mention that we have the possibility to, to access the VPH cloud. So you can reach supercomputers, high computational facilities from any, any, any place uh, of the world through this cloud. On the other hand, I don't worry about the, the computational or the IT requirements. Because imagine or, or think about your phone, your mobile phone, and think about the mobile phone five years ago. There is an enormous uh, development and, before, uh, and change or, or increase in the, in the computational structure or, 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 or possibility uh, even in your in your mobile phone. So this is a very and and the technology is cheaper and cheaper. So I think that uh, if you find you can find uh, the solution now, even if you are working in a in a small hospital through this cloud, but cloud uh, solutions. But I think in some years you can do a lot of things. You can realize a lot of uh, projects in your own computer. Are there any other questions from the attendees? I see a raising hand. Zara Asgarupur. Hi, Zara. Please address your question. Uh, Zara is asking about uh, the software tool which we, which we use for segmentation. In general or in, in, in our practice? In our uh, uh, practice, uh, we use the uh, uh, Mimics and the Simpleware uh, tools. But maybe, Peter, you can answer this question more properly. Actually, uh, we done these uh, studies in uh, Sheffield at the Insignia Institute, uh, where I personally use uh, Simpleware for the segmentation. But for some other uh, studies, we use also uh, 3D Slicer, which is an open source uh, uh, software. For planning, you can use some features from the simpleware, but uh, uh, I can recommend the uh, Autodesk Fusion to uh, 360, which is uh, generally a CAD software, but it uh, allows uh, to use input geometry, STL, or other uh, uh, surface mesh files, where you can uh, do some uh, really nice manipulation. And uh, after that, you can export the geometry to uh, FES A solvers. Uh, so sometimes we use uh, these uh, Autodesk Fusion 360, which is uh, free for uh, academical purpose and for students. Okay, great. Any other questions coming in? No, I don't see any other question. Okay, good. So I think we should really conclude the webinar now. Um, I wish to really thank Aaron for the great and very inspiring presentation. Thank you all for having joined today. Goodbye. Thank you for the possibility. Thank you, Martina. Thank you, Aaron. Goodbye. Bye. Goodbye. Thank you, everyone.